Good morning, Pottersville Church, and thank you so much for joining us and worship on this Palm Sunday. And we would like to take this very special time of the year to think about God's gift of salvation that He holds out to each one of us as we consider a new theme, His perfect love. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, it describes an occasion where Jesus had approached the city of Jerusalem. He asked his disciples to go ahead and to get two donkeys and to prepare them for him. And then he got onto the donkey and entered Jerusalem. And this was in order to fulfill a prophecy that was made about him in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And a very large crowd of people had gathered around and they spread their clothes and branches that they'd taken from trees on the road. And they were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, in keeping with our previous theme, Mission Possible, last week, Pastor Kevin was talking about embracing life. And in that sermon, oh, if you missed it, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to please go to our website and listen to that because it's very, very educational. But in that sermon, he was talking about a time where Moses depicted Jesus becoming sin for us by raising a serpent in the wilderness. And as a result of that, we become the righteousness of God. And so as we think about righteousness, I'd like to talk about God's perfect sanctification. His perfect sanctification comes in, in a holy place by God's provision through the Prince of Peace for our purification. And if you really want to get the most out of this lesson, then I'd like you to substitute your heart for the city of Jerusalem and try to imagine Jesus, the Prince of Peace, coming into your heart to be the king of your life and to provide all that you need for your purification so that you can stand before God. And so as you think about your heart, I'd also like you to think about relationships. And if there's one special relationship in your life, that's the one that I'd like you to focus on. But as we do that, and we think of this place representing your heart, the place, Jesus entering Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a really rich history. And I, I wish that I had the time to talk about all of the great things that happened in that place. But we can only talk about a few. But I want us to remember, at least to have as a take home, the one thing that says Jesus was going to make a cross on a spot that would demonstrate the full extent of God's perfect love for us. But going back to the days of Abraham, there was a time when Lot, the nephew of Abraham, had been captured by four of the kings who had raided their area and they'd been taken away as captives. When Abraham heard about that, he got 318 men from his army and he pursued them to try and get his, son, uh, get his nephew back. And so they did. They were successful in their mission and they got some plunder that they brought back as well. And then in Genesis 14, 18, it says, Melchizedek, the king of Salem brought out bread and wine. Now, he was the priest of the Most High God. And they have this time together, but this is a very, very special meeting because Salem was the name of Jerusalem before the Jebusites lived there. Then it became known as uh, Salem of the Jebusites or Jebus Salem and ultimately Jerusalem. But we're introduced to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And Mel his name Melchizedek comes from two Hebrew words, Melek and Tzaddik. So he's Melek, the king of Tzaddik, righteousness. So 
the king of peace and the king of righteousness is Melchizedek. And here is Abraham enjoying bread and wine with him. In this, not in this place, but, but later on, I don't think A. Abraham realizes at this point in time that he's going to be invited to a very special place where all of this is significant. But Abraham is just happy to meet this king. And he is able to present a tithe to him. Later on in the life of Abraham, when he is 99 years old, God appears to him and God says to him that he and his wife Sarah are going to have a child. Abraham bowed with his face to the ground and he laughed as he said to himself, can a son be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah have a child at the age of 99? And as he questions that, I'd like you to question the ability of God to provide. We're going through a very difficult time. It's been more than a year that this virus has just turned our lives upside down. And in a lot of instances our relationships and our finances and our ability to provide for our families have come under attack and now is a good time to be able to look to God for provision and to recognize that our God is a God who can provide God provides see Abraham had waited 24 years up until this time for this child of promise and it sounds now as if he has come to accept that Ishmael, the other son from Hagar, is going to be his heir. And he is ready to settle for the second option. But God wanted to keep his promise. God was going to provide. So when Abraham was 100 years old, he and Sarah had a child. Isaac was born. And if Isaac had been born perhaps 20 years earlier, Abraham may have just considered that a natural event of childbirth. But now there was no doubt in his mind that this was a supernatural event. And sometimes the delay in the fulfillment of a promise or the delay in an answer to prayer helps us to fully recognize the work of God when we experience the fulfillment of the promise or the prayer being answered. And I know that's not always the case. I'm reminded of a time when a man was working on the roof of his house and he started slipping. So he asked God to save him. He carried on slipping. So then he said, God, if you save me, I will go to church every Sunday. And he kept on slipping. So then he promised that he would tithe every month if God would just save him. And as he was going over the edge of the roof, a nail that was sticking out hooked onto the edge of his clothing and prevented him from falling. And while he was dangling there, he said, oh, okay, God, don't worry. Uh, this nail over here has saved me. He had turned something supernatural into something ordinary, as if nails save people all the time. But with Abraham, this was completely different. He knew with certainty that the birth of Isaac was the work of God. And so when the test came, he was ready for it. Genesis chapter 22 verse 2 says that God appeared to Abraham and he said, Take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will indicate to you. And it turns out that the mountain that he was talking about was Mount Zion, Jerusalem. So early the next morning, Abraham got up and he saddled his donkey. And as the story plays itself out, you see Isaac carrying the wood of the sacrifice going up this hill. And as I think about that, and I think of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, I wonder if he wasn't thinking about Isaac on that Palm Sunday. But if we go back to the experience of Abraham, 
we recognize that having experienced a miracle of his faith, where he had waited for 25 years for this child of promise, that now he knows that God is a God who comes through on his promises. He can fully appreciate the power and the goodness of God. And so when he is asked to do this, he's asked, go and sacrifice your son. He is able to do it because he knows that God is going to raise this boy back to life again. In fact, when they were going up in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, he said to his servants, you too stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go up. We will worship and we will return to you. Abraham knows that he and Isaac are going to come back from this experience. Sometimes the testing of our faith just solidifies it. And while Abraham and Isaac were climbing up Mount Zion, there was an awkward moment. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 7, Here is the fire and the wood, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham replied. And the two of them continued together. And as you think about that, let's recognize Mount Zion is a reminder that the sacrifice for sin is a sacrifice that had to be perfect. That the standard is something that only God can provide and Jesus travels into Jerusalem knowing that he is that perfect lamb of God who is going to take away the sin of the world. He's willing to do that because he loves so much. The place where this happens is forever going to be a place of interest. But as we go back to Jesus traveling on a donkey into this place, we need to recognize that this is a place of peace and that Jesus comes in peace. You see, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was riding on a donkey. Historians tell us that normally when a king entered a city, if he was on a horse, then usually that was an indication that war was going to follow and coming in on a donkey is a symbol of peace. And Jesus is coming in peace. Salem means peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Righteousness. And He is coming in peace. Righteousness is the scepter of His kingdom. And if we think back to Jerusalem and its history and the history of the temple there, we need to recognize that whenever the right king was on the throne in Jerusalem, the people were always going to experience peace. And the Prince of Peace is always going to be coming to give you peace. And in this place, if we go back to another time in history, in the, in, in the time of King David, there was a time where a plague had gone and ravaged Israel. And it had started in the north and people were dying. 70,000 people died because of this plague. But if you read 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 22, it says that David went to a man named Ornan. And David said to Ornan, Sell me your threshing floor so that I can build an altar to the Lord. And I will pay top price so that the plague may be removed from the people. And what you, what you see happening is that this plague and the angel of death just traveling through Israel and people dying on account of the plague. When the angel gets to this place, the plague stops because God recognizes how much the love for his people is going to drive him to be the sacrifice for their sins. And later on, David arranged for the temple to be built at that spot, the, the, at, on that plot of land that he brought from Onan. And it's the same place that Abraham gone to sacrifice Isaac. And we continue to think about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and the temple. We, we see the temple as a symbol of purification. And Jesus is coming in for our purification. 
Now, the temple is a symbol of purification, and our purification is really difficult to understand throughout history because it was supposed to be the place where the people of Israel are going to come to to be cleansed for their sins. And when Jesus came to the temple, he could see that some changes had taken place here, that the house of prayer had been turned into a den of thieves. And it wasn't the first time in history that something like that had happened. And even at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus cleansed the temple. Now he's coming into Jerusalem. A second time he's going to cleanse the temple again. But this temple is one that had been built by Solomon. And when it was built, there was that prayer of dedication. And then there was God appearing to Solomon in the night. You read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Beginning at verse 12, it says, The Lord appeared to Solomon at night. And he said to him, I have answered your prayer. And I have chosen this place to be my temple where sacrifices are made. And when I close up the sky so that it doesn't rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land's vegetation or send the plague among my people. If my people who belong to me humble themselves and pray and seek to please me and repudiate their sinful practices, then I will respond from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now I will be attentive and responsive to their prayers that are offered in this place. Now I have chosen and consecrated this temple by making it my permanent home. I will be constantly present there. You must serve me as your father David did. Do everything that I command, and obey my rules and my regulations. Then I will establish your dynasty just as I promised your father David, and I will not fail, and you will not fail to have a successor ruling over Israel. An incredible promise, but it's a conditional promise. It's conditional on the obedience of God's people to his laws and his statutes, and this isn't something that we get to see playing out in history. We recognize that there's a time in history when the people of Israel have gone into idolatry. The idolatry is so bad that they even bring idols into the temple. And so when the Babylonians surround the city of Jerusalem, you see that there is no protection and they get taken as captives to Babylon. And you see the Babylonians actually totally destroy that temple. And there's nothing left on the mound. Later on, there are two men who come back to Jerusalem. This is 70 years down the line. You've got Ezra coming back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And you've got Nehemiah coming back to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And as they do that, and as they dedicate the temple, it's just, joy in the hearts of the Jewish people to know that they have the temple of the Lord back as a part of their society again. But when Nehemiah goes back to serve King Xerxes, an interesting thing happens. One of the people who was opposed, vehemently opposed to the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, a man by the name of Tobiah, who is an Ammonite, somehow he gets to get the priests in Jerusalem to give him a room in the temple. The room that was supposed to be used for storing the grain that was to feed the Levites is in the temple. And now all of that is out and Tobiah is in the temple. When Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem and he sees that, he is outraged and he, he kicks Tobiah out. He fumigates the temple and he asks the people to recognize that this is a place where the law of God needs to be upheld and honored. The Ammonites were not even supposed to be allowed into the temple, let alone be given a room there. But as you go through history, you, you see that that cycle repeats itself. The people of Israel are going to continue to rebel, to bring idols into the temple. And even in the days of the Greek Antiochus, uh, Antiochus IV, 
he came in and he was able to get the Jewish people to allow him, the priests, you know, if he, if he just paid them the right amount of money, they allowed him to build a, an altar to Zeus in the temple and they were offering sacrifices to Zeus there. When Antiochus was really outraged by the Jewish people and wanted to show his utter discontent for the temple of God in Jerusalem, he did the most abominable thing that he could do at that time. He brought a pig into the temple and he sacrificed it there as if he was saying to God, what are you going to do about this? But the glory of God had departed from the temple at that time. Prior to that, the high priest could not go into the Holy of Holies without being sure that he's not going to be struck dead there if he doesn't honor God properly. And now he is a Gentile in the temple and God is doing nothing to him because his people are not living the way that they've been called to live. And so the temple had been completely desecrated. And you had a situation now where some of the Jewish people are looking at the, their history the promises that God had made to them, but how that they had been slaves in Egypt. And when they came out of that, they came into the promised land and it was wonderful while they were under King David. But as soon as they started moving away from honoring God, their lives became miserable. They'd gone into slavery in Babylon, that they'd been ruled over by the Medes and the Persians. And now the Greeks are ruling over them and they're recognizing the need to get back to the cover, the protection, and the provision of God. And so what they did, there was a man by the name of John Maccabeus who started a revolt against the Greeks. And he was getting the Jewish people to say, we need to change the way that we think about God. And we need to just remove idolatry completely from our land. And so they started this war and this revolt against the Greeks, and they were really successful because the power of God was with them. It was unfathomable that the small band of militia could rise up against the Greek empire that was ruling the world and actually prevail. And this is because God's favor was with his people when they're recognizing his provision and his protection. There was a change that took place in the minds of the the Jewish people at that point in the time of Maccabeus. You'll remember as you look through history that the people of Israel were always only too willing to turn to the pagan gods of the people around them. When they were in the wilderness, they were buying down to a golden calf and they were always wanting to go back to Egypt. That they would worship the gods of uh, Baal, Asherah, so many of them had Asherah poles in their backyards and, and, and altars to Baal. That Malkart and the, the gods of the pagans were so attractive to them. And like I said, in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, they've got a temple to Zeus, uh, uh, an altar to Zeus at the temple of God. Things are really, really bad. But from this point on, from the revolt, the Maccabean revolt forwards, there is a change in the heart and the minds of the Jewish people. And from now on, they are not going to be willing to bow down to foreign gods. In the times of the Romans, the Romans want them to worship Jupiter, the counterpart of Zeus, and even to worship Caesar as Lord and God. But the Jewish people refuse to do that. They have had a change of heart and a change of mind. And this is a good time for God's Messiah to come in and to be able to make that sacrifice that is a demonstration of love. These people's hearts have turned to him, and he is going to give up his life in order for them to have a chance of eternal life. Now, it is true that not everybody has a full understanding, and that even among the Jewish priests in Jerusalem at that time, there's that sense of jealousy and and, and not wanting to lose their position and the power and the authority that they have. And so you see Jesus, Jesus coming into Jerusalem on that Sunday, and here is a crowd that is just bowing down to him, and they are worshiping him, they're recognizing him that he's the king, and they're saying, Hosanna, which means save us. They want salvation from their God, and it is going to happen. They're going to be saved. 
But what we don't know is just a few days later, that very crowd that is honoring him and praising him is going to be turned by the religious leaders of his day and they're going to be vying for the blood of Jesus. They're going to be asking for his crucifixion. And this is because Jesus has come into the temple and he has seen the corruption that is taking place there. He can see that God's standard for purity isn't being met, that they've got a system in place that isn't a very fair system. You've got people who are saying to the pilgrims who are coming in from all over the place to worship God that they have to change their money to buy the animals that are worthy to be sacrificed. And if you have people bringing animals from far away when they get to the temple, you've got priests who are inspecting the animals and saying, this isn't worthy to be sacrificed to our God. You better buy one of these other animals. And you can't buy it with, with the Roman currency that has got an image of Caesar on it. You need to change that and get the Hebrew shekel. But there's a commission for the change and they're, they're making money out of the transaction. And Jesus is outraged by that. There are some historians who are even saying that sometimes you'd have a worshiper walk away and the animal that had been declared unfit to be offered to God was being sold to somebody else as he walks away. And now all of a sudden, there's a miracle that has taken place and this animal has become perfect and, and unblemished and worthy of the sacrifice. And when Jesus sees this, he feels like, the temple of God has been turned into a den of thieves and he, he moves the people out of there. And the religious leaders don't like the fact that their profits and their income has been hurt. And so they have a plot through which they're going to see to it that Jesus gets to be crucified. But Jesus is only too willing to go to that cross because he wants us to understand the extent to which he loves us and he wants us not just to be loved by him but to be able to spend eternity with him and so as we look at the history of the temple and we're seeing its need for purification we're recognizing that when the jewish people rebelled against rome rome came in and totally destroyed their temple in the year 70 a.d and after 70 a.d there has not been a Jewish temple in Israel. There is no temple there anymore. But Acts chapter 17 verses 24 and 25 tells us that that is not a problem to the Christian community. It says, The God who made the world and everything in it, who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives life and breath and everything to everyone. He truly is the God who provides. And he is one who is able to give us everything that he needs, that we need. He is going to make sure of it. Jesus knew that the temple in Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And so he instituted a system to which the Holy Spirit will be able to live in us that we would become that holy temple, that we would be cleansed by Him, by the work that He does for us on the cross. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, Paul writes to Titus and he says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of His mercy through the washing of new birth and renewal through the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us all in full measure through Jesus Christ our Savior. God has provided for our sanctification and the Holy Spirit continually cleanses us from our sin so that we can be a sanctified people, that we can live in purity. So while the temple in Jerusalem was designed to be the place 
that God's children could come to to be cleansed and to receive the sanctified uh, the sanctification so that they could be the kingdom of holy priests. When they turned to idols and when they allowed the idols into the temple, the temple was desecrated and destroyed. But when they honored God, the temple flourished. And if we're seeing our hearts as the temple, we need to look into our hearts and see if there are things there that should not be there. And sometimes we try to fix the situation ourselves and we don't do a very good job. We need to be willing to allow Jesus to come in and to cleanse us so that we can experience his perfect sanctification. We think about the place, Jerusalem. We think about the relationships. And as you think about that special relationship, for those of you who have been married, you've got to recognize that this marriage institution is the most incredible relationship that you can have because every kind of love is encompassed in that. It's beautiful. And when Jesus helps us to understand this perfect love of God, how much God wants us to be with Him. The book of Revelation describes the new Jerusalem that is coming out of heaven as a bride that is perfectly dressed and adorned for her husband. It's the idea of a marriage, the idea of a covenant relationship, the idea of faithfulness, of purity, the idea of provision and protection. And God wants us to see that. And he lets us know that this is the place where there is going to be no more crying, no more dying, no more sickness, no more fear. God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, but his dwelling is going to be with us. That there won't be a need for a temple anymore because we're going to have the always ever present Holy Spirit with us. We be in the presence of God forever. This is a promise that he's making available to the Christian community. And this is why we need to live a life of faithfulness to be sure that we remain faithful to God and have that. And for those who have not chosen to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, I appeal to you. There's a, a number that's on your screen. God can come in and completely cleanse your life and bring to you a peace that surpasses understanding. He wants to do that. He's, he want, he's willing to die in order to make that happen. So do call that number and allow the king of the universe access to your heart to completely change your life. Call the number. And those of us who have made that commitment and we're remembering that we have marriage vows that we made to our spouses and that we have this certain hope that we're going to spend eternity with God Let's celebrate that in the way that Abraham did with Melchizedek as they brought out the bread and the wine in that holy place or in anticipation of that holy place and just enjoy the communion of a God who absolutely loves us. God bless you as you make the most important decisions of your life and allow him to set up a permanent throne in your heart. Amen.